co-host it with uh, Stephen Carr. What a great... Um, Great host we have here with uh, Stephen Parr, and what a great space. So I guess our lighting is uh, about as good as we can get. How's that? Uh, that's fine. And, uh, Do you want weird. it on you? Huh? It looks like Tannen. Huh? This angle. Do it that, that way? Yeah. Good. Professional lighting people. That's and we got Dan uh, recording. Dan, maybe yeah. up here. And um, we're going to start in a second here. Great. Well, thanks for showing up, everybody. It's nice. Mm -hmm. nice. Yeah. Thanks, Stephen, for having me. And um, I love this man. Yeah, this we got an audio cassette. Really um, VHS over VHS here. VHS audio cassette. <laughs> <I'm true. Yeah. laughs> Digital. And uh, Eric yeah, has some uh, some goodies over oh, there. Oh yeah, so I got some old, you know, Gutenberg objects that we can you know, <laughs> shop through Still later. Cool, so Eric, it's a real pleasure having you. Thanks, Thank you Gary. so much for your time and energy. The first question is, what is the best thing for a human being? The best thing for a human being? <laughs> uh, gosh, the best thing for a human being is to, uh, let's see, be in love and be aware of it. Beautiful, I like that awareness. So what's your favorite form of information? My favorite form of information? Uh, well, if we're going to say that information has some sort of external body, so that I, I would not include my own perceptions as an answer to that, uh, if it's some kind of media or some kind of thing, like um, I would probably say, uh, God, favorite form of information is uh, uh, sonic information, yeah. stuff that comes in through the acoustics whether it's actual uh, sound of speech or um, uh, acoustic registers of a room mm -hmm. or, or information about a space that comes from acoustics. Yeah, that's good. Because the first part you said reminded me of Craig Baldwin's great answer. What's your favorite form of information, Craig? He says, human touch. Yeah. Pretty good answer, yeah. you got to admit. Yeah, yeah. And yours was fine, thank you. Um, <laughs> Is good. Well, I said, you know, I did a love one the first time, so human touch, love, it gets a little excessive, right. you know. But, uh, you know, uh, Norman Klein said, uh, what's your favorite form of information? He said, honest. So that's her. Yeah. But but here's a quote that I'm curious. I'm ready. Go for here's a quote. I'm, I'm, I'm curious that if you made this quote up, I found it on um, one of your articles. Oh. In the beginning uh -huh. was the info, and the info was with God, and the info was God. Right. Did you make that quote up? I did. That is a great quote. <laughs> I usually do all these quotes, that's and I good. was like, geez, I can use an Eric that, quote. That was good. And that's the information. So why do you think humans collect information? Uh, beyond the usefulness of it, which is pretty clear, the way that it, like collecting information is going to help you, uh, you know, gain power and control over nature and, and you know get your goodies in line and the good old you know self-interested robot that we all have inside of us but beyond that what is the obsessiveness with information there's a a feeling that information can deliver us a kind of uh, power but not just power over things but that there's something in itself that, uh, that there's like a, a cognitive rush almost that happens with data and we I think we experience it now when even just watching a film like the, uh, the daubs there where you see lots and lots of in images on top of one another and even though the content is actually relatively thin compared to sitting down and reading a book that has a lot of data in it there's this sort of buzz that comes from it and I think it's a flavor of that almost sort of mystical desire for you know, an overwhelming bit of knowledge um, that, that was one of the things that I was interested in like playing with the mysticism of information putting information in for, for, the, for the logos Right. is this idea that like w our relationship to information is kind of like a parody or a or a, or a an echo of some uh, of a mystical kind of experience um, and that we but we don't really go for that because it's too weird and it's hard to do and so we just sort of but we do have a, have a glimpse of it yeah. in our uh, fetishizing and consumption of information. Yeah. That's good. Uh, James Joyce said you can find epiphanies in everydayness so you can get a buzz Hey, the information, right? Isn't that almost the definition of the epiphany? Yeah. I mean, the epiphany is almost constructed by its everydayness. So yeah. going up to the top of a mountain isn't really having the 
you know, Epiphany is one of the like the light, you know, glints off the yeah. the crappy Toyota on your way to work. And you <laughs> have this like That's vision good. of the absolute. That's mm -hmm. an epiphany. That's good. Um, do you think our tendency to collect information is hardwired, or did we learn it? Mm, well, it's so hard to say with human beings because, you know, at what point do you say something is hardwired? If it, how far back do you go to say, well, that was something that was set up. I mean, I think it's more than just something we learn as individuals growing up in an infomaniac society. Um, I think anytime you go back, you're in any sort of situation, there's going to be some people in any given tribal situation or whatever who are, who are collectors of data. You know, a shaman would be spending all his time like figuring out plant lore and getting lore from other people and talking to the plants and trying to get more lore. And the lore would be, it's like a and d like if, you know, if you're going to be a fighter, it doesn't really matter how much lore you have, but if you're going to be a cleric, you know, you need a lot of lore. So there's like always certain characters in society that are going to um, have a kind of infomaniac uh, tendency, uh, both for power and just because it becomes part of their subjectivity, part of the way they experience the world. Mm -hmm. um, what's the earliest memory you can conjure up? At all? Yeah. Uh, there was a weird uh, triangular shadow on the wall of my of the room that I slept in when I was like three years old, and I don't know why it stuck in my head, but there's there's uh, it's like this long it's like this weird elongated triangle, and I think it was you know I can remember seeing the door kind of close and open and close, and I would look at this weird shape. Mm -hmm. And um, do you think peculiar? Huh? Yeah, that's <laughs> great. Well, you know, yeah, it's also I was one of those things, and I was reading once in like uh, Whitley Strieber, and there was talking about like <laughs> these buried memories, and there was one that was like this weird shadow that I saw when I was a kid, and I was like, oh shit, <laughs> <laughs> you know, just what, yeah. just what I need is like some, you know, it's a mask or something else. Yeah. Um, do you think um, memory is a curse or a blessing? Uh, both. I mean, yeah. if you know too much. Too much memory would, is a horror show, but without memory at all, then while maybe that experience would be blissful and free of many of the forms of suffering that we have as human beings, it would be so alien to us as to effectively be, you know, just kind of un, unassimilable. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's definitely it's definitely a two-edged sword. Yeah. You know, you can you know trauma is a terrible form of, of memory and. Um, uh, we root ourselves in, in our memory, and yet that's also, you know, creates the consistency, the narrative, the sense of return, the sense of resonance, the sense of layers to one's experience. You're not just having the experience in front of you, you're also, you know, remembering it's echoing off of other experiences, it's echoing off of books, it's whatever. So it's also like this rich tapestry, this rich weave. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, Nietzsche is totally right that, I mean, it's, that, that, you know, if we were not able to forget, we would be totally screwed. Yeah. Uh, I wish I had a better memory. No, you know? well, yeah. Well, James Joyce, maybe you're going by it. James Joyce said, remember to forget. So, um, how about your, who, <laughs> who are your uh, earliest role models within your immediate family? Just briefly, like, and what specifically, how they influence you? Like, within your immediate family, who were your role models? Like, 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 Dog or something? Or <laughs> well, me, me, like my mom or my dad. Yeah, immediate family would be mom or dad. Role models, uh, or or like uh, uncles, aunts, uh, grandparents, or or I, like I had an, brothers I, or sisters. I had, a, I had an uncle who was who was he, he was kind of a cool stir. He had a good mustache, and he he was into the Beatles, and he smoked a pipe. And I started. I would well, I remember <laughs> yeah. I was really excited when I finally got to smoke a pipe, like yeah. Michael Bob. Um, and he had just Bob. kind of a, he had a kind of, yeah, he was Bob. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, um, uh, yeah, that I guess I guess that would be just, but he just had a kind of hit air to yeah. him that I thought was kind of was groovy. And then how about <coughs> outside your immediate family? Any major role models or influences early on? Early on? Yeah, or um, even if you can't go early, like wherever. whatever, yeah. you know, Bilbo Baggins and Bugs <laughs> Bunny. Really? Nice. And what'd you learn from them? What's that? What? What? How they influenced you? Well, I, actually, I was I was hugely influenced by The Hobbit. I read The Hobbit many, many times when I was from like the age of, I think, when I was six or seven. I grew up in a um, 
in Southern California, in Del Mar, and we went. I, I went to a very groovy elementary school, and it was, uh, you know, very 70s. It was like a multi-grade, and they had like these partitions that they would kind of constantly change, and it, everything was sort of like hexagonal, and it was all open, and you know, very, very 70s. And that we did like transactional analysis for tots. Any of you guys know that? Uh, cold, you know, uh, cold pricklies and warm fuzzies. Anybody out there? Anyway, so so it was that kind of scene. And they read The Hobbit to us, I think, when in second grade. And then I immediately started reading, and I you know read it and reread it four or five times. And on the way home from school, I used to go through this uh, beautiful canyon. I was really blessed to grow up in a place where there were still little bits of nature, even though it was largely suburbia. So we'd climb down through these, uh, you know, uh, dry arroyos, and like it be, you know, it became Mirkwood. So it was an initiation to the imagination. That yeah. was good. Thank you. And so, uh, were your did your parents raise you a particular religion? No, I was not baptized, and there, though Christmas, you know, uh, was the sort of ritual holiday, it was pretty much devoid of of uh, sentiment beyond, you know, the, the, the family gathering. So I, I had very little sense. My stepfather was Greek and there was a brief period of time when I was about 10 years old that we went to the Greek Orthodox Church because my young sisters, you know, it, was, it was more of like a social thing. So that was my first experience of like the peculiarity of organized religion and, and mine was, it, it was peculiar. Mm. Uh, so and uh, so yeah. do you think uh, evil people exist or does evil use people as a vehicle? Whoa, that's a good one. That's a good one. Do I think, uh, I would, of those two options, I would lean towards the latter. Um, I think that, that anybody who's like acting evil and enjoying it is still kind of being taken for a ride. Uh, so, uh, but you know, but it's pretty hard to do when you're faced with the most, you know, malicious evil people you can imagine to not ascribe some kind of uh, responsibility there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, this question is about enemies and how you deal with your enemies. And it's uh, there's a couple of quotes I'll set it up with. First one is um, Alan Watts says, "If you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them." Ram Dass says, "I'm having a real hard time loving George Bush or fill in the blank made off or who, who are we hating right now?" Mm -hmm. Coppola stole from the mob. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Uh, JFK said. Uh, Forgive your enemy, but don't forget their name. And then the Chinese proverb goes, he who cannot agree with his enemy is controlled by them. So basically going back to Alan Watts, do you think if you acknowledge your enemy, do you empower them? Um, no, not, not, in a, not in a savvy way. I mean, there's a way in which like, it's just like acknowledging that there's an obstacle on the road and you're driving along and you're hurtling at 60 miles an hour and there's this, you know, huge lump on the road, it's, it's wise to acknowledge that so that you can veer, but to acknowledge the enemy as enemy maybe is, is, seems to be a little bit of a, of a, of a misstep. Um, for me, I'm just fascinated by the challenge of communication and understanding other people. I've always been really interested in that question, so I'm, I've been drawn to people and ideas and things that are repellent to me because I, I'm very curious to find what's the shred of commonality. And I'd like to think that I do that with people that I could, could consider my enemies, although I, haven't, I don't think I've, I've been blessed and I have too many explicit enemies, um, where it's almost like, how does one get to that place? The same thing with evil, like how does that work? How do you get there? Is there some shred of commonality? So I think it's, I would still acknowledge that there's something like yeah. an enemy on the field, but yeah. they're ultimately empty. Yeah, good. And uh, James Joyce was the first projectionist in uh, Dublin. And uh, he said, uh, I'm out of here, this is stupid. Why should you go inside a building and see a movie of a tree when you can go outside and see a real tree? And Faulkner later said, sometimes the best fiction is more true than journalism. So why do you think humans need to recreate something in order to get it? Uh, recreate it, but they're not really recreating it. I mean, it's always something new. Like a right, right. Really a recreation of right, but a let's say, you know, you, you go to a theater, well, you like go to a theater and you see a play and they're acting out sure, life. Sure. Well, no, and instead, well, why don't you just live life? Why do you have to go see Because it? one of the things about living life is that there's, in any situation you're in, there are frameworks, and those frameworks are largely hidden. And one of the things we get with art is in art, we're allowed, we're allowed to make explicit and play with the frameworks. And so by doing that, we actually reveal more about what, what our normal lives are because they reveal the plasticity 
of the networks. And I think it's pretty hard if you're just living life to be as aware of the assumptions and frameworks that are shaping kind of invisibly your perspective and your view, whereas art lets us explicitly reconstruct those and, and experiment with them, um, uh, you know, and it, and it becomes a kind of a form of memory too. And yeah. it, it expands the dimensions of memory. That's good. Um, what first attracted you to pursue um, performing writing? You know, basically what you do now. What first uh, which which private? Right? Well, let's say writing. What first? Writing. What first? You know, attracted you to sure, pursue sure. writing. Sure. I just I enjoyed it from the minute I was assigned writing in, in school when I yeah. was like ten years old, and they wanted us to write a story. I went, that was fun. So I always just I was always very easy for me to express myself in writing. Like if I look at stuff that I wrote when I was eleven or twelve years old, it's like yeah, that's pretty much me. It's yeah. like the same. It's like my voice was in writing right away. So it's a sense of power. And then it was just easy and fun. And, yeah. Um, and then I became well. It's the idea of a voice. You know, like what it, like you know what characterizes particularly when you're talking about nonfiction writing, because with fiction writing we often think about there's many voices, voices of characters and the, the narrative capability. When we talk about nonfiction journalism or uh, essays, it's really about a voice, like what is a voice? When you can read something, oh yeah, that guy's got really has a distinct voice. And I was really interested in that because it was simultaneously something in me um, that I was exploring and discovering, but it was also like another guy, like this kind of character. Like I would be in this kind of mood and I sit down to write and this other voice would happen. And I was kind of fascinated with that. It's like a certain, like almost like a kind of channeling. And it would happen very quickly. It's, and and often I would sit down, I'd have nothing to say. And then, you know, it happens. And it's, uh, that's kind of, kind of magical. So yeah. why not keep doing it as long as you can? And did your parents raise you a reader or did you choose to read growing up yourself on your own? Hmm. I don't think I had books crammed down on me, but they were, they were, you know, my mother was a, was a reader as well, and we certainly read a lot of books when I was a, a little kid, but um, no, I distinctly remember turning to reading really a, in a big way after The Hobbit uh, when I was 10 years old and I lived in Greece and I was very isolated, and so books became a kind of escape, mm -hmm. and I would go and like I learned how to take the bus to the American bookstore and I would go and buy science fiction. And, and I moved on to the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. You know, discovered pornography in, in books. You know, wow, this is really fun. And, you know, <laughs> so I became a very enthusiastic reader. 